This one's on the other side of the spectrum. I think there's going to be a little, probably, uh, I'll call it discussion by the town board. Maybe town board members uh, would like to uh, opine on where they're at in this process. Um, three weeks ago in this boardroom, there was a public hearing on this. We heard, I think, Dolly from 26 different people, 21 in attendance, and then five write-ins uh, that were written into the record. We also uh, have accumulated some other people's comments since then. They don't go into the public hearing record, but certainly the town board members have been forwarded those so they can look at this thing from every angle, so they can make an informed, educated uh, vote on this. Um, I think some of you, in fact, I saw Debbie on the 8th, a week later, as we were leaving toward you said, well, how did the vote go? And I said, well, we tabled it, or we took it off the agenda for the night, because the town board decided we had so many documents and requests for information that we had not gotten yet or gotten so late in the process that we didn't have enough time to really discern. So we put it off on the 8th and put it tonight because last week we ran a wonderful board meeting. There was only four of us here and I say once again, you can do a resolution and get a majority, uh, three or four, when there's only four board members here. But I go back to the complexity of this. It really merits having all five of us in the boardroom and all five of us voting on this. And I think it was said back on the first, I think this will be the last time until April 4th, okay, that the, all five of the town board members will be in the same room just uh, at a board meeting. So that's my prelude to this. With that being said, um, do any of the board members want to lead off with any comments or findings or anything about this uh, potential resolution? Everybody's looking my way, so no, I guess I, I, was, I will good. start. Since everybody's looking my way, I did a lot of research on this, so I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, I know there's a, a, a lot of emotion, as you said, around this, Tom. And a lot of people came to spoke, speak for and against um, repealing this law in its entirety. And we listened to those, and I summarized the, the, the folks who were uh, against repealing the law. The primary concerns there were safety, noise, um, and, and lastly, the fact that the law only benefits very few or one person. Uh, the primary considerations of those um, in favor of repealing this law was that the FAA governs the skies. Um, certainly, there are a number of boards other than the FAA. There's the New York State Department of Transportation. There's also the National Transportation Safety Board, which has an awful lot of information. So there are pilot training requirements, there are strict maintenance requirements, and some of the other um, comments were disinformation, fear, and questionable motivation. Those were the summary of the folks for and against. So when I look at um, some of the things with noise safety, starting with noise, I did some research on noise and decibels that a helicopter would make um, at 100 feet, the noise that a helicopter makes is similar to that of a chainsaw, jackhammer, power tools, or a motorcycle that's at 100 feet. I think most of the neighbors are more in, in between, say, between 100 feet and 500 feet. At 500 feet, the, the uh, noise goes down to basically the sound of a lawnmower. Um, or a very large barking dog. It's not a big dog, but a dog. Um, beyond that, in a mile, it's the same sound as a vacuum cleaner. So, I mean, from a from a noise perspective, to me, it would it would seem that the noise that this helicopter would make for the short period of time it was taking off and landing 
would be very commensurate with other types of sounds that you might find in the neighborhood. Um, another thing was about it being in a residential neighborhood. So as I would do if I was on the planning board or when I was on the planning board, I actually walked around the area. And in, in well, DeWitt Road is certainly a residential area. Um, the, the piece of property where this, the, well, where the one individual in Webster who currently has a helicopter comes in and takes off and, and lands from, um, the neighbor is really Route 104, Route 104 to the south and to the west is the bay and about, uh, I don't know, 30 plus acres of an open field. So, so, so from, from that aspect, I would think that um, there certainly is, from a noise and from a space, I, I would say, I, I, I would conclude that it's really not that atypical. A helicopter, I guess, is somewhat atypical, but the noise it would make is not atypical of what you might find in a neighborhood. From a safety perspective, I think, and this was mentioned and it's very true, many helicopter accidents include, um, are, are a cause of pilot negligence. And um, there was some information shared at the meeting about helicopter crashes. Um, I would say, I, unofficially, what I can find on the internet, there were 17 helicopter accidents and, and they're mostly, or if not all, in the New York City area. You will find there were 94 helicopter accidents in, in uh, all of 2003, so between April of 2003 and February of 2004, there were 94 helicopter accidents. They're, they're, and that's across the entirety of the United States. Um, most of those accidents happen in areas where they have a higher, obviously, number of helicopters. And in addition to that, in areas where there is tourism and there are helicopter tours, so of those 94 accidents, not that any fatality is, um, you know, nobody wants any fatalities, but the fatality rate in a helicopter accident is about 20%. So I just, when you, when you, when you look at this data, and I mean, lots of things are, are dangerous, but. Helicopters are right in the middle of any other form of transportation as it as it relates to safety risk from from being in or near a helicopter. I also spoke with a commercial helicopter pilot because I work at an aerial limited company, so I do have some extra context about what it takes to fly um, commercial or private private aircraft and. Um, one of the reasons that the fatality rates tend to be so low in the helicopters is because there are certain FAA requirements for where you can fly and how you can fly. And you need to make sure as you're flying, you can have an appropriate glide path to landing because with a helicopter, you actually can land it by gliding, which is part of the reason why the um, accidents aren't as, um, as uh, if they are fatal um, um, it, on average. So uh, that was my safety. Um, sorry, I'm going through. The, the other thing, this kind of goes to the safety aspects of maintenance and then the what some folks were saying about um, um, the FAA requirements. So when, when you think about this, this law that Webster has, it's, it's almost like it's an extra layer, but there are very stringent laws from you know, the FAA and the New York State Department of Transportation that govern helicopters and any aircraft. And um, the, the, the part that I'm actually very familiar with is the maintenance, so we, um, Eagle View has like a, over a hundred aircraft and every single one has to go for scheduled maintenance and, and ongoing maintenance and those planes can't fly unless they are in perfect mechanical condition which is 
why the FAA is in place and they have those those rules to protect the health, welfare, and safety of the people who are around those types of um, vehicles or aircraft. Um, there is also uh, regular training that is required and, and rules. So this one I looked up, whether, I don't know that this is the only one, but the FAA Pilot Flights and Ground Instructors Chapter 14, Subchapter F, Part 91, you know, it speaks to the level of training that a helicopter pilot would need and that they have to maintain with ongoing training to be able to fly. So I think that you have the New York State Department of Transportation, you have federal agencies to ensure the health, welfare, safety of regulated helicopters in New York State. There were a couple of other things that I think I would like to share that are not necessarily pertinent to the law, but to address some of the comments because that were made, made towards me as the, the um, treasurer of the Republican committee, which I was for a couple of years. And if I go back and look at all donations, dating back to 2006, the average contribution is $432. The highest contribution from any single organization was nearly $9,000 at $8,996. The top 10 non-candidate contributions averaged $3,972. If you look at a shorter period from 2015, it went up to $3,486. So when you look at the, the um, contributions from John Kashani of $1,500 um, to the Democratic Committee or to, um, to, to Tom's campaign or to the Republican campaign, those are not out of line with any other organizations or individuals who contribute to political organizations. And in addition to that, John also donated another $1,100 to a number of other campaigns um, for judges, Ontario, um, other town council, and um, uh, the Democratic Committee in Walworth. So all of this information is public. You can find it very easily on, on the New York State Campaign Finance website. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate the comment, you know, I appreciate the perspective you can have that this is a, a payoff for changing the law. But when you look at that in total, I would just like to say that that is not what that was, and it really is not even the appearance of that. Then lastly, and uh, um, Councilman Cahill said this at the last meeting in the closing remarks, specifically about Tony Kashani. Tony has been on the planning board or has chaired the planning board for, I don't know, probably 30 some odd, close to 40 years. And, and one of the comments was made that by former supervisor Nesbitt, that Tony, that in here, basically bribed him, or he took, took it as a bribe that Tony was trying to get him to repeal this law. And I think, if that truly was the case, then I don't know why Tony would still be on the planning board. And I just think that that was not not fair and a little out of bounds as it relates to this law or it relates to Tony personally. So those are those are my comments. Thank you. And just to follow up on your your last few statements, um, I did speak to two people who were reportedly told about this attempt to bribe. I am one of these people recall um, the past supervisor stating that Mr. Schein attempted to bribe it. It would seem to me that something of that magnitude um, they would remember. So again, I've known Mr. Kashani for a number of years and he's probably one of the most honorable and hardworking men that I know. And I thank you again for your service this community, sir. Um, just to follow up, 
on some of the comments that you made regarding the, the FAA and their regulations. I went through many of the same documents that, that you went through, and you know, helicopters are very, very heavily regulated, not only from a maintenance standpoint, but more importantly from a flight standpoint, coming in and going out. Um, and I don't know if you had commented about the uh, requirements for the actual pilots and the physicals that they have to go through also. I did not comment. So I just wanted to mention that. And when I was reading the um, the minutes that, that, that Dolly put together, um, a number of people spoke that they were against the removal of Section 103 because um, it would benefit just one person. And in my opinion, it's my opinion, Section 103 was put in place purely as a punitive measure against one person. So that's all I had to say. I can certainly understand, and Jen, I really appreciate all the, the research that you did. It's certainly very thorough. And when I listened to those who came to the public hearing, um, I took several notes and tallied it all up. There were 10 people who thought it was a good idea that we repeal this law. Um, four of them were pilots. I would expect them to say nothing else. Uh, there were 16 people who spoke against, many of whom are still in what is considered the neighborhood. And I um, just have to say that I'm, I'm not sure that a heliport, a landing a helicopter, is really a proper thing for a neighborhood. And I appreciate the maintenance and the safety concerns and the training. Let's not forget that all of those things are in place for anyone who flies a plane, no matter what what that aircraft is. And yes, they go through safety checks. Last night on the news, there was a, there was a plane where the wing was falling off. A door blew out of another one. All of, these, all of these aircraft went through vigorous safety precautions and inspections. But the bottom line to me is, this is not an appropriate thing for a neighborhood. Well, the thing is, really impacted me when I was reading through the regulations is the fact that the FAA regulates the flight, the flight path and if they were to come to the determination that it is not safe to enter or to be Can you microphone my hearing people say they can't hear you? So the thing that, that, that had the biggest impact on me with respect to the helicopters in that area is the fact that the FAA regulates the flight path. And if they did not feel it was safe, they would not come to the determination that it would be allowed. Mm -hmm. And that to me, they're, they're more of an expert than you or I or anyone on this board, in my opinion. Okay, um, this is my opinion, and again, this is my opinion. And I thank you, uh, Tony, for your years of service. And it's great to know your name as well. But this is my own perspective, you know, I do respect homeowners' property right. To be clear and fair, we do care about the safety of our citizen here in Webster. Instead of a local law repeal, don't just end it. Why don't we just amend it or change it? And to add the heavy pack, you know, on at least two or more acres of land adjacent to the lake on the bay because the FHA made, you know, proposal. So this way when they, the person or anyone that take off a landing, they're not going to go over people's houses or buildings. Um, and it's not for personal use. We can add that, you know, in there, in the law, and then, um, it's it only for personal use only, but not for commercial use. And the application, I mean the applicant can apply to use a permit on the town if more than one, you know, have the helicopter and they will need to, you know, spend their time and money to, um... Well, I think one thing that's very important to note here 
is that this law is just about taking off and landing in the town of Webster. Anybody can fly a plane over Webster. Anybody right. can fly a helicopter over the town of Webster at any time. Um, and if we repeal this law, it does not mean that planes or helicopters will not be flying over Webster. They just won't be taking off and landing on the ground or, or water surface area of Webster. Just to, to your point, Jenny, about safety and saying, you know, we don't want helicopters flying over houses. They will be. Um, at at uh, the um, Army Reserve Center, they have helicopters flying in and out of there, and I would argue that it's more densely populated there than it is at the end of DeWitt Road. Yeah, that's true. But then you don't have, you don't want to have a Pandora open up and have people flying all over and what they wanted to land. You know, I have two acres in my backyard and they land in my backyard. Well, know, so they, there should be a... To that, to your point that you're making, you don't want to open up Pandora's box by getting rid of the slob. No, someone, yeah. someone in the village of Webster, or someone that has two acres of land, still has to go through the stringent process of contacting and working with the FAA and the New York State Department of Transportation and Aviation Reports. And they will come out and they will do the evaluation. And if they determine that it's not safe, they will not be allowed to the, the, the flight path is strictly determined based on evaluation of the FAA. And I don't think anybody in the village of Webster is going to be allowed by the FAA. The other thing is what's what's before us is to repeal this law, not to amend it. Correct. Okay, that's just my suggestion. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was awesome. Very nice, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the board. That was a lot of research. Uh, appreciate that. Um, okay. Jack Shani is not in the room tonight. Let's see another problem. That doesn't mean he's overweight, Tony, okay? Uh, I have a question before I give my comments. Um, because, Tony, I know you and your son are very close. So I'm going to say that you are a de facto, your answer probably would be the one that came out of John's mouth. If the board repeals this law today, and Charlie, whatever that means as far as tomorrow is done, or it's a Whenever it is filed, the day it's filed, the repeal, would John think he, on that day, can start planning on that health board and taking off? Well, I don't know how that, whether the law works now. <coughs> if the law wasn't there. If, it's, if, it's, if the law is repealed. Yes. The we law is no longer in existence. Okay, will you land tomorrow? Should I yes. just, just yes. maybe up at the microphone or something just for the benefit? Uh, for, for people to hear it, I, like I said, I, I appreciate we're yeah, not going to hold I, this. I, I can't answer directly, but if that was the case, somebody would have to say, John, don't fly until we get this thing totally resolved. 100% agree. Well, what, and I don't know what, what would be totally be resolved? Done. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose the question again before I okay. get my camera. If the law is repealed, and when it's formally repealed with the Secretary of State and whatever, it's as though the law never existed going forward, right? Correct. Going forward. Going forward, right. So if there's no law to prohibit landing and taking off a helicopter, do you think John would think at that point, free at last, I can land the helicopter and take it off at my FAA-approved heliport and New York State Department of Aviation-approved registered? My guess is probably so, because without a law, there's nothing that says you can't do that. It's an open field. And on the right. other side of the coin, we have, like you said before, there are seaplanes landing with boats all over okay. the point of bank. Tony, thank you, and I appreciate I probably should have had, but Tom, here's my concern. One, one, one thing before, yeah. before you go, with respect to your, your question regarding the law, if it's not in the books, there is a stringent process that Mr. Kashani or anyone else has to go through 
um, prior to taking off or landing from a heliport, okay? And one of those steps is obviously getting sanctioned by the FAA, but there is a point where they have to come to the board. It's my understanding from what I read. And John, that's what I'm going to comment. Okay. okay. Because yep. here's, here's, I, I guess I, when people take that podium, and tonight people will take that podium in a public hearing for the conveyance plan. When people take that podium for the five minutes open to the public at a board meeting, it's been an interesting four plus years for me as supervisor because I'm a, I like facts and truth and really try the best I can to be straight with people at open meetings like this or face to face with them. People get on that podium and either intentionally or unintentionally BS us all the time for reasons that run the gamut. Okay? But when Jared Hurt, the attorney for John Kashani in this, that you have combated with, have you not, Charlie, over the years on the different lawsuits or whatever? Oh, not on the lawsuits, but in, in particular. Okay. When an China, attorney yes. takes that podium, I tend to hold that person's words to a higher standard than when anybody else takes the podium and can just say whatever they so when Jared Hurt took the podium back three weeks ago tonight, he said something that resonated with me so much that you might notice in these meetings that I write down things. I write down things that I think that I gotta go and check on. And what he said, he said it is an incredibly robust process yes. with the FAA, the New York State Department of Transportation Aviation Division, and the town board. So, this town board thing, I, when I went to start asking questions, and Tony, you were in on these emails, I asked on Saturday the 3rd, less than two days after the public hearing, okay, now that we've had the public hearing, here's some things, and I asked three questions, and I said, Charlie and Jared, you're the guys who are the attorneys. I'm doubting Thomas. I want to see documentation that substantiates what he said on, the, on, that, on that podium. Over the last 20 days, I've been surprised. Maybe I'm not a good communicator. Maybe I didn't ask the questions correctly, but I'm concerned that I'm not getting documentation that at least in this old accountant's eyes is ticking and tying and supporting that robust process. Now, when I look at Dolly McGuire and I say, Dolly, you're a town clerk, I need to know if there's anything in the town records at board meetings plan that was uh, re about this subject. What I, she comes back in 24 hours with stuff from 1963, 1978. She finds that stuff, right? Now, I understand. Finite records, town of Webster. I said to Charlie and Jared, if you're telling me that at the 930 other towns in New York or whatever it is, that don't have a specific law, that those towns, anybody with a heliport in those towns has to go through the FAA, the New York State Department of Aviation, and their town board. Could you please go and look for the last five or 10 years of precedent cases, if you want to call it that, that went before those town boards after they got the FHA, uh, FAA and whatever. Now, Charlie, I don't know what you researched. I don't know what the database was. I don't know if it was Association of Towns, but your answer back to me was, I found none. Now, what does that mean? It either means that Charlie, and Jared was quiet too, all right? It either means he found the resource that the Association of Towns would have such a, uh, an answer, or a, uh, such a hearing, and there were none. So it all sounds like, does that mean nobody has ever in New York State in the 930 towns gotten a help board in the last five to 10 years? I find that hard to believe. Um, I, you can't prove something by something that doesn't I'm just matter. saying. Um, and I'm gonna tell you something. When I started my research, I didn't have a dog in the fight. I just like facts. I just wanted to know, I wanted to see how the process that Jared explained how it played out. What was the application process? How did they come out and do this? What kind of license did they get? How long does it last? Is it renewed every five years? Is it this and that? And maybe I just didn't ask the question right, but I didn't get the documents I thought I was going to get 
that supported this robust process that included, and I can't be more key on this, that included a town board shot at the apple, bite at the apple. Now, I thought, we get a bite at the apple. This is a no-brainer for me. This law is a joke. Why would this law have ever been written 17 years ago if in the normal course of a health board, you got to go through the town board anyway? Right? That's what Jared said. Wasn't that the process that was yes, described to us? Correct. Have any of the board members seen proof that the way it's done is a town board part of that process to approve, and it's zoning and neighborhoods and stuff like that. Because just because the FAA says okay on this place, and just because the New York State Department of uh, Transportation and Aviation says it's okay, the way it was described, and he said, Jared sent some cut and paste stuff over to us, hey, this is fr frequently asked questions, the town board has a shot at it. But as we sit here tonight, I, I don't see anything, I wanted to see some precedent town board answers on these things. From a town in Binghamton, from a town up north, from a town on Long Island, because I want to recreate the wheel. I wanted to see well, how, what do they, what, does, what is the town board's bite at the apple? What are the things they take a bite at the apple once the FAA, allegedly, and the New York State Department of Transportation a, uh, Aviation has said yes. What would the town board at that point be ruling on? I couldn't guess. So I figured, Charlie, pull a couple precedent cases. Maybe it'll start to, you know, come into uh, 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 clarity of what they rule on. Is it the neighborhood thing, Patty? Is it the flight pattern? But to our surprise, and once again, Charlie, I'm not holding to you this to, the, to this. Yeah. When Dolly tells me she looked back in the records of the town of Webster, when I asked her about a subject, I would like you to find something, if there's anything on the town board records, of Tony Kashani's heritage. You go through it, and if you find nothing, I feel very confident we've never done a town board resolution or whatever in 70 years on Tony Kashani's heritage. Sorry, I didn't mean to use that as an example, but there it is. What he researched, and whether it is in totality, you can't prove a negative. You just told me you found nothing. That concerns There's something me. right here. You found a town? I didn't find a town. Oh, I, I got that from Jared. But you have this from the New York State Department of Transportation, so I guess if you email their aviation department, you can ask that question because it, it states right here the first step in, in the first step in airport or health port establishment or modification is FAA airspace review and approval, which examines impacts uh, on nearby aviation facilities, blah, 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 right? And call this person. If the local... Can I have that from him? Yeah. Does that just mean that every other town, if there's been 100 heliports in New York State in the last 10 years, that just no town ever followed that? Oh, it's it's possible. It establishes a process now. My understanding of that is I'd rather see. I, I think the question is, and this is not to go on your side, the question is is whether the process ever, has ever been used. That's really the curious. No, it's something well, if, if that's the process, okay, and I don't really care about the other towns. Other towns might not even know about that process, okay? That might be an answer to why there's no precedent. But if that is what came from, okay, because I want to make sure, when we talk about amending this law and this and that, think about some of the things you said, Jenny. To me, I'm like, why do we got to amend the law for that? If the process has the town board have a bite at the apple on this thing, we just get rid of the law and do it at that point in the already established practice for process through, what, 249 and FAA and whatever? Okay. You get that. But I was having a hard time understanding what is the towns in that process? What do they discern in that process? What, what is it about? Is it, it, and I just figured if I found a precedent case, because obviously towns follow that process. Maybe they don't. Well, I don't, I, I actually did that research too, and I don't have the number in front of me, but when you look, there is a, a not a lot of helicopters in the United States. So the 
fact that you might not come across that wouldn't be too astounding or alarming because I don't think it's a pretty common thing. Okay, but here's the thing, and, and I understand that John, and I'm done now almost, I'll come full circle back to asking Mr. Kashani to be the de facto guy. John will watch this, so John will hear it from my mouth. If his thought was that if we repeal it tonight, that once it goes to the Secretary of State and it's papered up and it's law now, or should I say it's not law anymore, that he's landing that day and taking off and having a big party. He's not, because he's still got to go through this robust process. Right. Yes. And I want to make sure he understands that. And I don't understand the process enough at this point to even get a timeline of, okay, the law is now repealed. Um, Charlie, when do we come to the board? Is it now that he's got FAA approval of that site? Now that he's got registration with the uh, uh, New York City Aviation? When it comes to the town board, what are we ruling on at that point? It, it, there's two ways you can come to the board. Either the board can ask the FAA for it to weigh in on right. the approval. Correct. Or the applicant can ask the FAA to work, to, yeah. uh, work on it. However, there's, there's also the issue of whether or not I'm not going to get into this too much, but the fact is, is this still a permitted use? There's a question. Just because it's not in there doesn't mean it's a permitted use. Yeah. And it is only. Well, that, and that's, I, don't, I want to set expectations if this gets repealed. We obviously we've spent about 40 minutes on it. Uh, where was that? You have the paper copy. I'm looking for Jared's send over the frequently asked questions. While you're looking for that? Yeah. I said initially when we first started going down this road that I might be able to consider an amendment like Jimmy mentioned, but that is not what the applicant wanted us to look at at this time. That is correct. So I go back to what's before us tonight is a full repeal of this law. If we're going to go to amendment, we would have to go through an entire new public hearing process. That is correct. So I'm at, what you have as a printout is what I'm going through just as you, mm -hmm. in that packet. It's a bit of a cut and paste. It's not, you know, if you really look at it, there's some cut and paste there. But this is the frequently asked questions, commonly asked questions. New York General Business Law Section 29. What do I do if there is no local zoning? You must still apply to the locality and ask for their approval. What can I do if the local government doesn't wish to approve or take no action in regards to the airport or airport approved and proposed? I assume that means heliports too. You'll have to talk to your local a further. I think, I don't know, I just couldn't find specificity that gave us a, a, a blueprint of that process. I think I understand the FAA side. I think I understand the Aviation Department, New York State Department of Transportation. I don't understand our side. And I don't know if John factored that the, the, the repealing this, if we do that tonight, is a step in the process because it will, if he wants to land there, he's going to be right back here at some point in the future. And you'll have to do some. What are we doing in this our, this section 249 that is this very robust process with the FAA, the New York State Department of Aviation, and the town board? What are we doing? Because we have a bite at the apple. That's the way it reads. And I really was, I don't like to read it. I wanted to see what other town boards, what did they rule on this? We haven't found it. Maybe we just didn't look at the totality of the data. I, I, can, I can say... Absolutely, that without town board approval, a helicopter or a heliport or an airport would not be built. Correct. Not be built. So we're not talking again about the flying so much as the construction of the helicopter. The taking on the landing and, and, and that's, that's like that. the issue, I think, that's before the board. Right. And that cannot be done um, without town board approval and consequently with approval of the yeah, Department yeah. of Transportation. No, not the FAA. Or the Department of Trans Transportation. Right. Yeah. Okay. And yes, helicopter, helicopter can be used interchangeably with fixed one. Uh, 
Chapter 103 of the Code of the Town of Webster, Aircraft, Airports, and Heliports. I'll second it. Councilman Cahill? Aye. Councilwoman Wright? Aye. Councilwoman Wynn? This is very emotional for me. And like I said, I was elected to be put on this place to do what best for our community and to do what best for everyone. And it's not just for one individual. And sometimes a hard decision had to be made. And I don't want to lose friends, but I don't want to, you know, to. Um, Think that this may affect our the safety of our citizen in the community. So it's really, really hard um, for me to to make this emotion. Um, therefore, I don't think I can. I don't. I don't think I can pass this. This may. Supervisor Flaherty. Taking. Um, there's quite a history here. 
And so based on that and what's happening now with the $7.1 million, I'm just going to read a brief excerpt <coughs> from the chapter entitled Collateral Management. And it states, there would be an epic yeah. end point to the decades of seemingly wow. out of control financialization, which served no beneficial purpose for humanity. But the devastating well, effects of which are apparent even now, and has been a deliberate strategy executed over decades. This was the purpose of inflating the global bubble entirely out of proportion with any real world thing or activity, which must end in disaster for so many, with no pockets of resilience allowed to remain in any country. And so, again, I would ask, as a constituent of yours, that you please try to find this and read it. It's very important. We are now in the middle of what this is. And unless people stand up and educate themselves, there's no stopping it. And the end is not pretty. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. You're welcome. Great. Uh, next up is, uh, I hope I said this, secret. Secret or secret? Secret. 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 consider the background of the Coca-Cola plant. As you said, we are novices at building industries. And Coca-Cola, I have heard, has a bad reputation for pollution. Either air pollution or sewage pollution. So I would uh, suggest that you find out from previous members who have built buildings for Coca Cola whether or not they are realistic about their. Uh, estimated flow predictions. And to make sure that your extensions of the building are adequate or possibly could be extended if it was needed. As I say, air pollution is another consideration. I don't know anything about air, air carbon or any of that, but I do want to be sure that Webster doesn't pollute the air in Webster or that Coca-Cola doesn't pollute. I could complain that um, you have cut me off totally from TV of the town board and school board has already cut me off. When you cancel the uh, community access TV, I 
have no computer, so I can't address the town board's computer. So I'm not saying that you should pay for something that I am the only one who needs it. I'll just let you know that I have a complaint. Thank you, Sigrid. Good for you. Um, next is uh, Rick. I always do stories. I'm not an attorney, so you know, I hope you can trust a little bit about what <laughs> We hold you to that. But, 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 but I'm a taxpayer and a, and a resident of the town of Webster. And one thing that I think is can you everyone in this room can agree with that. I'm sorry, say what? Can you just please state your name? For oh, the I'm record? sorry. Rick Storacy, and I live at 1491 Providence Drive. And I think everybody would agree that the Coca-Cola Corporation is one of the richest corporations in the world. Whereas the town of Webster is not even the richest town in Monroe County, let alone the state of New York. $7.1 million that wasn't incorporated into the initial discussion, I don't know, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, I think they knew what was going on. They're pretty smart people. You don't build a company that big with that kind of money without knowing a few things. Um, I'm concerned a little bit about the money because we're paying for it, right? It's coming out of our pockets, not their pockets. And yeah, they may be bringing a lot of revenue to the town, and that would be a good thing. Well, what about the after effect? We already have a huge, I don't want to call it a white elephant, let's call it a brown elephant, in the Xerox campus, right? We're going to get another one? Is that what's going to happen here? I mean, I'll probably be gone, but my daughter won't be, and her kids may not be. What are we doing here? Okay, so I think as representatives of the, of the people that live in this community, it's the duty of the town board to do due diligence and investigation to make sure that our futures are not brown, right? That we don't get another situation like we have with, Zero, with the Xerox campus. I scratch my head a little bit and don't understand why Fairlife didn't go in the Xerox campus. I know there's a lot of reasons. Right? I'm sure they did a lot of investigation. I'm sure it'd be very, very expensive to clean that area. Mm -hmm. What's that say to us about what they want to do and how much money they want to spend? Now, I happen to be for Fair Life to come here because I know it would bring jobs and I know it would bring revenue to the community. But it's got to be the right thing for the community. So I think we need to really, really discuss this thing in a much deeper basis, a much deeper way, to make sure that you know the future of this beautiful town is maintained and upheld. Um, I had a couple other points, but not related to this, and I'm sure you don't want to hear about it. You got a minute? Okay, I got a minute and a half. I'd like to understand what $4.5 million in forward funding is. I'm confused. All right, our esteemed governor said that she's going to give the town of Webster four. No. Village of Webster. Village of Webster. Vill oh, that was the village. Yes. yes. Sorry. And then I heard something that I'm not, I, I don't have any facts to verify, but I heard it. So maybe you can enlighten me. 
I heard that there's some things going on where there's the state is trying to bring low income or middle or mixed income housing into the town, like they've done in neighboring towns. Quite frankly, I grew up, I was born and grew up in the city of Rochester, and then I moved to Webster. There was a reason why I moved to Webster. Okay? And it cost me more to live in Webster than it does in the city of Rochester. I don't want low income and mixed income housing in the village, in the town of Webster. I'm pretty sure that that guy. I don't know how she I, proposed again. that last year, and there was so much pushback yes. from the legislature and private citizens that it, it was dead on arrival. It didn't go anywhere. That's great. Which doesn't mean That's that great. she will not try again I know this she year. I know she everybody is well aware of what her intent is. Okay. I just, as a concerned citizen. No. Right? Very, and I very very you guys, point. and that's a generic guys, you guys need to fight for us. Right, and I believe Supervisor um, Flaherty mentioned a while ago that 19 other town supervisors got together and put a letter together expressing their opposition to the direction she was trying to go and, and sent it. And I'm sure that there are counties throughout New York State where the town supervisors and village mayors got together and sent the same letters, which is why it went nowhere. And if it comes up again, I'm sure the same measures will be taken. Just for quick information, there was a resolution at the Association of Towns meetings to this. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't hear what you said. You said there was a resolution by the there was, association. There was a resolution at the Association of Towns annual meeting, which just concluded to that effect, the effect in opposition. Yeah, that's great. I hadn't heard that. Thanks, that's great to hear. Yeah, just, just okay. Thanks for bringing it up. Great point. Thank you. Thanks. So <clears throat> we only have one speaker left tonight. What's um, good? Uh, the past town supervisor, Ron Nesbitt. And Ron, as you get ready to the podium, before you start talking, I'm going to saunter up there. I just want to make sure everybody in the room understands that Cope Fairlife is paying for this $7.1 million. They are paying for it. And that's, if you follow the board meetings and articles and our communication as best as we try to tell people, um, Basically, Coke is going to pay the town, in an, uh, I'll call it an industrial use agreement, uh, for our sewer plant, um, the monies that is really the specific infrastructure that the town had to improve or upsize specifically for them to come into town. Now the thing is, and we have talked about this in many board meetings. I just think a board meeting or two ago, we had a presentation on it at a, at a workshop um, and explained that if we got a one-time tie-in fee to the sewer system from Coke, it would be about $12 million. Correct, Art? That's correct. All right. But between this pipe, and the upsizing of the plant on Phillips Road, it's going to be more in the $24 million range of specific to Coke Fairlight town infrastructure cost improvements upsizing. So we said to Coke and Fairlight right from the beginning, there is no way that you're coming into the town paying us $12 million based on your flow for us, little old Webster. Because you're right, Rick. Coke's big. The state's big. The county's big. The fourth player in this is the town. And I've made this talk at this podium many times. We are going to guard against our taxpayers having an un disproportional tax burden of town tax for this project. And we're holding the line on that. And that wasn't always easy. We've been in some interesting meetings. And Patty, you and I will continue to be in interesting meetings yes, we will. with state representatives because the town is not going to be left holding the bag on this. 
So there's a misconception, and if you came to this saying, this is ridiculous, why are we paying $7 million for coal? Which is essentially what you said, Rick, and I understand why you would say it. That's what the sheet We're not. That's what the sheet said. Well, the thing is, it's our infrastructure. So it's would a municipal we, If coal wasn't coming here, would we change our infrastructure? No. And we'll that's why if we're building $24 million of infrastructure, they're going to have to pay for it. And then to your point, I don't mean to, I'm not trying to argue with you. By the way, I like this kind of discussion. I love it. Well, you, you come well by it. Um, I can't tell you if they're going to be in 20 years another white elephant and they leave town, leave another Xerox. Brown elephant. Or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, life's risk. We've tried to do this, and Paul, you're here tonight. So many conversations we've had with Cope and their attorneys have been with, hey man, I don't know if you're going to be here in 10 years. You're a $46 billion company. Markets turn, state regulation turns. You could abandon this $800 million plan in six years. So we are building everything around, tightening up, making sure that the town gets reimbursed in their monies. Don't give me this 30-year payback. I don't believe in 30 years. Because you're a big corporation. And our town has watched Xerox, a big corporation, leave like that. So that's fresh in our memories, and we've had to say to Coke and their attorneys, Charlie, if you're looking at us as being unreasonable because we're looking for this money to come in a shorter period of time, and you're like, oh, 30 years. No, I don't know if you're going to be here in 30 years. So I just want to make sure the record's straight on that. And man, I hope that didn't ruin Ron's talk, because I know you're probably going to say we're spending all this money and we're not getting reimbursed before we are. Let him talk. Ron, you're up. Jeez. No. I'm going to ask you, where is the legal binding agreement with Fairlight to show the residents how much they are providing to the seven million and what the residents of Webster, not the village, are contributing to the seven million. Where's the legal binding agreement resolution, Mr. Flaherty, that the Webster residents can see before you take this resolution this evening? Because it's irresponsible vote by the board members to do otherwise if you don't have an agreement. You're putting a horse before the cart. I would also like to know why... We are putting the horse before the cart. Thank you. And you already in slip. Okay. Horse before the cart. Thank you. I would like to know why the resolution for the $7 million bond was not published on the town's website 24 hours in advance as required by the law. Supervisor Flaherty apparently doesn't believe in the rule of law as Jerry Goldman has already explained to him. You see, Mr. Goldman made sure the environmental application by Fairlight was put on the website 24 hours in advance, and he told Mr. Flaherty about that. Uh, now the residents of Webster are hoping the other four members of the town board and town attorney will make it right for the residents of Webster to be able to read and understand these resolutions before a meeting as required under law signed by the governor back in November 21-22. And just for grins, the village board posts all their stuff 24 hours in advance. But the town of Webster can't. It's not good communications. It states in the public hearing notice, certain improvements. Well, what are those improvements, Mr. Flurry? You couldn't define them for us? You couldn't let us know? What on improvements are we doing? Also, in your July 19, 2023 column, you stated, quote, the end result is that the EDU charge annually for the Webster residents will be $300 a year. Well, my charge in my January tax bill this year was $296.83. And you're going to bond another seven million. And you're going to tell me that my next January silver bill will only be $300? That's total hogwash. A 
and you are not telling the truth to the rest of the residents, and that's sad, because you're going to break that $300, and you know it. You know it. No, by the way, where are all these grants the town was going to receive for sewer and the highway garage to reduce the cost to the taxpayers? And in closing, since I have a minute and 35 seconds left, I'm going to go off topic just a minute. Mr. K, nobody else was in the office that day. It was just me and one other gentleman. And my assistant will contest to it. He said, there's no other way about it. He wanted the law changed. And he would do anything to get me elected to do so. It's the truth. It's the truth. I disagree. Go ask my assistant. Okay. Thanks for stopping in. Appreciate, huh? appreciate your input tonight. Thank you. I got some. I got 54 seconds left. Okay. This camera back here is not doing the residents of Western any good. It's a hundred dollar camera. You bring in five hundred fifty thousand dollars a year in cable franchise fees. Let's get something. It's been three months now. Let's get somebody in here so we can hear and we can understand the town board meetings in my easy chair instead of me coming up here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ren. <coughs> um, I'd say that we're not trying to improve the quality of the video because I would miss Ron coming in and doing his five minutes of the podium. Um, and I kind of would, to tell you the truth. But we will, we're working on getting the dollars. Okay. All right, so that concludes the uh, public speakers from the audience. I'm going to close out the public hearing, which means that the town board now can talk, ask questions, or we might need you at the podium on that. Uh, from a decorum standpoint, the public hearing, I'm about to put the mallet down. The public, yes, Michelle. I have a question, very short and sweet. You used the word reimbursement, so my interpretation of that, and I'm not an accountant, okay. means that the taxpayers are going to pay up front, and Fairlife's going to reimburse us. No. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, all okay. right? You can always count on, well, hey, I broke the quorum today, so, you know, too wrong to make it, don't make it right. Three times. So, that's the end of the public hearing. So, let me, let me start on this one because uh, reimbursement, okay? You're going to notice that there's a resolution tonight that we will uh, consider, a re well, we're going to do this, a resolution to schedule a public hearing for March 7th to consider a local law change to section 257-165 and 257-166 of the Webster Town Code and to publish that change in the February 28th edition of the Webster Herald. Now, what that code change is, is that, and if you watched or come to our town board meetings, the one that was two weeks ago, we had a presentation about how our code, when it, it addresses one-time tie-in fees, to tie into our sewer system, was built in the late 50s, early 60s, and never had the vision, nor should it have probably, of a massive industrial user like Code Fairway. Translation, if we use the code as it's written right now, we would get $12 million from Coke Fairlife to tie into our system based on the flow that's been well researched, right Arthur? Correct. That they're going to put into the system. So they're going to pay up okay. front or we are? I'm going to, Michelle? No I, I, I don't think you know. So anyway. You should come to more meetings or watch the tapes before you come because this was explained in great detail is that for us to get the $24 million instead of the $12 million, which I would assume all the taxpayers would be happy at the work that Paul Adams has financed, Charlie as attorney and Tom Ward are doing, to make sure we get the full $24 million. But our code isn't written that way right now. Okay. So we have to amend our code to, on this tie-in fee, 
have a component for an indus a large industrial user. Translation. That code amendment will allow us to say, you're going, in more words or less, you're going to pay for the specific infrastructure of your company if it is essentially greater than the $12 million tie-in fee based on the $1,000 per equivalent dwelling unit, or $12 million. Now, Coke and their attorneys are completely aware of this. They've been working with us all along. So the bottom line is, once that code is changed, then there will be an industrial use agreement contract that spawns off of that, of which Coke's attorneys, along with you and Storch from Harris Beach, and we've outsourced it, you know, you want to do it right. That agreement essentially is going to be that they're paying this back over 10 years with commensurate interest, time value of money, but we're bonding it for 30 years. So you tell me, for the accountants out there, we're getting our money in 10 years for something that is bonded for 30 years. Which in essence, when you take that revenue that's coming in from that agreement, that's how you manage to keep the EDU charge to 300. It's all been explained. In fact, Art, when you went to the NIWEA meeting uh, down in New York, the sewer uh, association meeting, you, you texted me and said, what, what was our Joe DiMaggio hit streak again? The last 100 board meetings, board, how many have been uh, addressing our sewer plant and Coca-Cola and all that? 62 out of 100. This is omnipresent at these meetings. And I get it, you're living your life. You walk in here and you say, hey, I heard, why are we? I get it. Four years ago before I was supervisor, I'm living my life. I would have seen something on the agenda and not been privy to the 62 previous meetings that told the story honestly, up front, as best we could. We've answered that question probably a dozen times to Mr. Nesbitt. Where's the agreement? What are we doing? Signing this thing without the agreement. How many more times am I going to say? We have to create a code change to get the agreement. And that's just the facts. Now you can sit there and say, well, why are we doing that first and then going to this? There is a timeline of getting this process moving along. And so that's what we're doing. And I think the board and our finance director, and our attorney, and everybody who has followed this along has been like, yeah, I guess that does make sense. But when you come in late, and I understand, I would have come in late too four or five years ago. I'll explain it and recap it as best we can, and I'll try to Reader's Digest it, because it's been over 62 meetings. Um, but that's a resolution, I mean, I guess, you know, we're still in a public hearing. We're not going to do that resolution set the public hearing for the code change right now. We'll do that once we come out of, you know, this part of the discussion. So, um, do the town board members, because back on the 8th we had Kostich in here, the engineering firm who has done the design for the 7.1 million, and they did a PowerPoint presentation. A buddy net presentation was also the code change and how we're going to get paid on the 7.1 million. Um, do the town board members have any no. questions that, I, in our view, probably would be best for you? What, this 7.1 million, why do we need to bond it now based on the municipal Wix law process of going out to bid and, and, and getting that? Do you want to jump up there? Maybe Paul can even jump in on that as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have the engineer's estimate, uh, which actually came in at about $6,757,000. Uh, there are other soft costs that are going to be added to that. There, there 
other soft costs that, that have to be added to that. So, I mean, we need we need to get out the bids. So we need to get the actual cost, and uh, it's best to have the funding in place before you do that. The authorization for the funding doesn't mean we're going to go out and borrow the money immediately. The first borrowing will take place early in August when we renew the current uh, bond anticipation. Of I don't have any questions. I've been in most of these meetings, so I certainly don't have any questions. Section 3, this resolution shall take effect immediately. 
Uh, that is my motion. Second. Second. Supervisor Clayton? Aye. Councilman Kato? Aye. Councilwoman Lipeldi? Aye. Councilwoman Mike? Aye. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably going to have to read the entire summary. I would like to uh, have town attorney uh, truncate my next motion. There is a uh, motion by Supervisor Flair uh, regarding bond resolution of the town board and town register authorizing one issuance of $7,100,000 in civil bonds. Whereas the uh, town board of town of Webster is considering authorizing certain improvements to the town of Webster consolidated sewer district that encompasses the town of Webster, exclusive of the village consisting of sewer upgrades from Phillips Road to Tabor Road, known as the project, all set forth and described in certain engineering reports prepared by Costage Engineering, Land Surveying, and Landscape Architecture, DPC, dated to, uh, January 2024, which is on file in the Office of the Town Clerk, uh, whereas by Resolution 253 of 2023, as already stated, the uh, matter was, the project was considered a type one action under seeker and that there was no uh, significant impacts uh, upon uh, the environment thereof. Uh, that the by resolution adopted uh, just now uh, in accordance with section two, two, 202 dash B of the town law of the state of New York, the town board has determined that it is in the public interest to undertake the project an estimated maximum cost of $7,220,000. And the town board now wishes to appropriate funds for the project and to authorize the issuance of the town serial bonds or an anticipation notes, the finances appropriation. Therefore, the town board uh, of the town of Webster hereby resolves as follows that the town is authorized to undertake the project is here and above described and issue $7,100,000. Dollars principal amount of serial bonds, including without limitation statutory installment bonds, pursuant to the provisions of the local finance law of New York. And it is further hereby determined the maximum estimated cost of the aforementioned specific object or purpose is $7,220,000. Uh, that the period of probable usefulness of the aforementioned uh, specific object or purpose, in other words, the project is 40 years, pursuant to subdivision 4, paragraph A of section 11.00 of the local finance law. Uh, that the final maturity of the bonds to be issued pursuant to section 1 of the resolution shall be in excess of five years. Serial bonds authorized by this resolution and the bond anticipation note said the bond shall contain the recital of validity prescribed by section 52 of the law and said serial bonds and any bond anticipation notes issued in anticipation of such bonds shall be general obligations of the town payable as both to principal and interest by a general tax upon all real property within the town without legal or constitutional limitation as to rate or amount. Subject to the provisions of this resolution and the law pursuant to, to provisions of section 30 relative to the authorizations of the bond anticipation notes and of section 2150, section 54.90, section 56 through 60, and section 62.10 and 63 of the law, uh, the powers in town, uh, of, the, of the town board relative to authorizing such serial bonds and bond anticipation notes as to their form, term, and contents uh, are hereby delegated to the supervisor of the town, the chief fiscal officer of the town, uh, that is the supervisor. Supervisor is further authorized in his sole discretion to execute a project financing and loan agreement and any other agreements with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and or the New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation. Supervisors also further hereby authorized to take such actions and execute such documents as may be necessary to ensure the continued status of the interest on the bonds authorized by this resolution and any notes issued in, in anticipation thereof. Supervisors further authorized to enter into continuing disclosure undertakings with or for the benefit of the 
initial purchaser of the bonds or notes in compliance with the provision of uh, Rule 15C2-12 as promulgated by the Security and Exchange Commission. The intent of the resolution is to give the supervisor sufficient authority to execute all these applications, agreements, and instruments. The resolution shall take effect immediately, and the town clerk is hereby authorized to direct and directed to cause a copy of the resolution or summary thereof to be published in full, together with the notice attached in substantially the form as prescribed in section 81. Point zero zero of the law and the official newspaper of the town for such purpose. That's the supervisor's motion. I second. Supervisor Flaherty? Aye. Councilwoman Catali? Aye. Councilman Cahill? Aye. Councilwoman Wynn? Aye. Councilwoman Wright? Aye. Okay. Uh, our last item tonight is a resolution to schedule the public hearing for March 7th, 2024. 7:30 p.m. here in the town board room at 1002 NA Webster to consider a local law change to section 257-165 and 257-166 one-time tie-in fees for the Webster sewer plant of the Webster Town Code and to be published in the February 28, 2024 edition of the Webster Herald. Make a motion? That is my motion. I will second that motion. Supervisor Flaherty? Aye. Councilman Cahill? Aye. Councilwoman Vitaldi? Aye. Councilwoman Wynn? Aye. Councilwoman Wright? Aye. Now, um, before we leave it, I know a lot of people already left, and, and Bridget will we'll get with secret and figure out if we have her phone number, we got her address, and then we, obviously that's the first time we've heard from her about channel 1303, we'll reach out and see if there's something we can do to, you know, whatever. But everybody else who's here, if, if we can grab email addresses or whatever, because if you'd like, well, one, I hope you come on March 7th to the public hearing so you can get a lot more information about how this code change is the path to getting COPE to pay for these infrastructure improvements that you, one of them you heard about tonight, the seven million, and the approximate 17 million on the, uh, the plant upsides that is for their body. Um, but I'd also, if you want us to send you links to and show you how to go look at, at, at past board meetings that specifically tell the story leading up to this, because like I said, I can appreciate it if you came in and you're like, Wow, this is out of the blue. This seems like, you know, and hey, my, my predecessor, you're very good about getting up on the podium and making it look like this is out of the blue. It's not out of the blue. This has been a continuing story that has been told very transparently, very proactively from the beginning. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> one last thing since there's been a, I, um, I said earlier, Rick, I think everything you said was true. All right, not that I have a lie detector, uh, but when I say people get up on the podium, you know. Um, past Supervisor Nesbitt said that my July 13 column said $300 on your tax bill. Now the Andersons don't have that because they're in the village, so they got their tax bill, so this is, doesn't relate to you. But anybody who lives in the village, okay? you don't pay the EDU charge okay. for a sewer. And this year, the EDU charge, if you're a taxpayer in the town of Webster, was $296 and some cents between the uh, operation maintenance and the capital. And as Supervisor uh, Nesbitt said that my article said that it'll be 300 And they were going into all this bonding and, you know, this will be a lot more next year that we're going to have this what he's quoting from my article is, uh, and I'm giving the excerpt that gives a little more context to that, that this will give the residents a $300 annual EDU charge for the next 20 plus years, pending what grants we get, if any. Let's stop there for a second. Meaning, 
we did all this estimate with Paul Adams and whatever, and worst case, if we don't get any grants, and we are continuing to pursue those to the best of our ability. We didn't want to give a pie in the sky. We wanted to give worst case. The next sentence said, this $300 annual EDU would be once the sewer plant and the Coca-Cola Fairlight plant are built and fully functioning in 2026. Now, do you remember how I said that? Do you remember how I said that if you follow this story all along, I wanted to make sure the citizens understood that it's going to be difficult as we're under construction of those two plants before all the revenue comes in and all of that. We might have a 2025 blip because of the bond anticipation no interest while this is being built. Now, what we hope in 2025 is the way we can offset that to not have a $350 or $400 uh, EDU charge is this industrial use agreement. Because Coke would be paying us significantly more money than what their $24 million would be costing us at that point in, in interest on a band. Is that correct? That is correct. And that excess, when you throw it all into the mix, goes into how much the EDU charges for that year. So I appreciate Supervisor uh, Nesbitt pulling one thing out and no, putting his, under uh, spin on it. But I just want to make sure the people that were here understand that we have tried to be as forthright with the citizens on what's going on as possible. Uh, so that's all I guess I got to say about that. And that concludes tonight's meeting. Uh, like I said, Bridget, if you wouldn't mind outside, if people want to give their email, and we will send them, you know, the links to these various meetings. Okay, um, if they want. And I certainly hope that everybody comes back on March seventh because I think there'll be some more information. Now, um, I am uh, making a motion for us, the town board, to go into executive session uh, under section 105 of the New York State Public Officers Law, um, section 1, sub section, where is it? Charlie, where is This is, uh, uh, I'm looking for litigation. This that would be uh, D. Discuss proposed path? Yes, subsection D. Um, and I'd like to invite to that uh, Captain Mark Reed, um, Police Chief Dennis Kohlmeyer, um, Finance Director Paul Adams, and Town Attorney uh, Charlie Genesi. That is my motion to go into second session. Um, okay, so the clarity. Aye. Aye. Councilwoman Kelly? Aye. Councilwoman Lynn? Aye. Councilwoman Murray? Aye. All right. Well, and as you know, Dolly, I'll lock up the mic up. Yeah. I hope to see everybody back here on March 7th. Let's go. You want to say that you're doing this at the village board meetings to get out the village and the sewer plan? No, I don't think you want to come here. She's packing up the plant and moving the What's that? Yes. Unbelievable. You and I both know. Shall I never say that? Tom, you didn't say I never should. You said you needed to go to the village board. Fridays the first. And you're not. No, the I don't appreciate it. Okay. Three, three, one. So you got a lot of work to do.